we're talking about um, what I call the six points of Calvinism, not the five points, but the six points, which is TULIP plus the sovereignty of God. Because the Calvinists are wrong on the sovereignty of God, which makes them wrong on the other five points. They have to make the Bible fit into their conception of God's sovereignty. And their idea of God's sovereignty is that God makes all decisions. Okay, if you actually have a free will and you can decide what you are going to do, then that robs God of His sovereignty by their way of thinking. I disagree with that entirely. Uh, my dear wife is down here. Um, she cooks 99.9% .9 of all the cooking that is ever done in our house. And so I don't think it's very smart for me to tell her how to arrange the kitchen cabinets. Okay, she can put the pots and pans where she wants and she can arrange the food and the pantry however she wants. Um, because it just seems to me the smart thing to do. Well, God has given us a free will. He is the absolute sovereign of the universe, but He says, I'm going to allow you to make certain decisions, including whether or not you will trust Christ as your Savior. And, uh, okay, so anyway, we have covered um, the sovereignty of God. We covered it first just briefly, giving an overview, and then we covered it in detail, and we have also covered TULIP, the total depravity of man, uh, starting with T, total depravity, then U, which is unconditional election, and today we are going to cover, Lord willing, in this hour, we're going to cover limited atonement and irresistible grace. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We appreciate being able to be here. We thank you, Lord, for those who are with us and ask you that, Lord, that today would be a blessing uh, to every person that's here, um, including me, Lord, uh, that we'd all be blessed for having been here, for having uh, heard the Word of God. Uh, may we be uh, edified, built up in the faith. May we learn things and may we be encouraged uh, in our service for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, limited atonement. Uh, and here is a Calvinist definition of limited atonement. The doctrine of limited atonement is simply that the cross of Christ provides a sure, secure, and real salvation for everyone God intended it to save and for them alone. Okay? So Christ did not die for everyone. Okay, now you probably think, but I thought the Bible said He did. Well, the Bible does say that. <laughs> okay? The Calvinists managed to interpret all of the verses that say world and whosoever and etc. Um, into meaning the elect. They have no basis for that. They cannot give you a Bible verse that says that that world means elect, but they just always keep that in mind and they'll put it in their, their marginal notes in their Bibles, okay, that elect or world means elect, whosoever means elect, and so on. Um, they won't give you a Bible verse to back it up, but they'll say that. Okay, um, that quotation was from a fellow named Grover Gunn, uh, who is one of the lesser known Calvinists, but he agrees with all the rest of them. Um, here's another one from a couple of guys, Steele and Thomas. Christ's redeeming work was intended to save the elect only and actually secured salvation for them. His death was a substitutionary endowment, or pardon me, endurance of the penalty of sin in the place of certain specified sinners. 
Okay, so God in eternity past looked down over the entire human race and somehow or other decided that he's going to, to pick you, 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 and you, and leave out all the rest. Okay, and Christ only died for those whom he chose to save. Um, if man has anything to do with salvation, including exercising faith, anything to do with it, then God is no longer sovereign in their minds. Okay, which I think is a ridiculous proposition, but that's what they believe. Um, the Calvinists reason that if Christ died for all, then everyone would be saved. Okay, now again it goes back to sovereignty. If God is the sovereign of the universe, it is not possible that He could make an offer to anyone that they are capable of refusing, rejecting. Okay, if, if I were God, and you should be glad I'm not, uh, if, if I were God and I decided I'm going to give this watch to Terry, I'm not, okay? <laughs> but if I were, and I was God, then it would not be possible for Terry to decline the offer. Okay, and if he could decline the offer, then I would no longer be the sovereign of the universe. Okay, that's their reasoning. That, this is why TULIP exists. They're wrong on sovereignty. So they have to come up with TULIP. The Bible, I think, makes it clear that salvation is not something that God secured for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It is something that He provides for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but which He says we must accept by faith. Okay? The Calvinist says God regenerates you and then gives you the gift of faith, and then you believe. So you're regenerated. What's another term for regeneration? Born again. You're born again before you believe? Doesn't that seem to be contrary to quite a few verses in the Bible? And the whole idea a person can be saved I mean, that's what born again is, right? If you're born again, you're saved, you're a child of God. That's the new birth is being born of God. So you're saved before you ever believe. You know what? That's screwball. Okay, I'm sorry, but that, that, that makes no sense at all. Okay? Now, let, let, me, let me say this, because when I use terms like screwball, uh, or hogwash, or baloney, or, you know, things like that. Many, 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 many Calvinists are brilliant people. They are thorough scholars. Unfortunately, they study the wrong stuff. Okay, they need to study more Bible. Throw away the theology books, or at least put them on a back shelf for a while, and get to the Bible. Okay, that's what they need to do. Um, they also, many, many, many times, are good people. They're not nasty. They're not unkind. They're not wicked. Okay? They, they may be as good or better than most of us. Okay? They happen to be wrong. Okay, that's the problem. And good people can be wrong. And they're wrong at least on these things. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So Christ is the Savior of everyone. He's, he's, salvation is for all. But it's only effective for those who accept it. You have to believe. There's so many verses that say you have to believe. And if you don't believe you don't get the salvation. Okay, without faith you have no salvation. You believe and you have it. Okay, so it's available for everyone. 
And I think the Bible is quite clear. Uh, let me give you some verses here. Uh, the Bible in some places says Christ died for some people. Oh, some people. Yes, he did. He died for some. He, Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus died for the church. Okay? That's, that's very clear. Jesus died for the church. Matthew 1.21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Okay, he died for his people. Um, Acts 5.31, uh, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Jesus died for Israel. Okay, wow. Of course, by Calvinist logic, that should mean that all of Israel is saved. But they're not. Okay, um, Okay, these verses are true, but they are not exclusive. You notice the absence of the word, and I mentioned this the last time I was here, you, you don't see the word only in those verses. He didn't die for only the church. He didn't die for only his people. He didn't die for only Israel. Okay, if I say, Jesus died for me. He paid for my sins. Does that mean he didn't die for yours? By saying he died for me, I'm not excluding you. And God certainly is not excluding you. Okay? Did he die for some certain categories and classifications of people? Yes, he did. Did he die for certain individuals? Yes, he did. But he also died for all the other individuals. Okay? Um, unlimited atonement. And here's some verses that I think show that it's unlimited. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Guess what, beloved? That's everybody. We all fit in that category. Okay? We all do. Um... John 1, 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Everybody's included. Um, 1 Timothy 1, 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came in, into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And the Bible says, For all have sinned. So everybody's covered by that verse. Okay? Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And the lost is everybody until they come to Christ. Okay? Um, okay, the next verse is the very best verse in the Bible on this subject. Okay, the very, very best. If, if you want to remember one verse for this point, this is the one to remember. 1 John 2, 2. And He is the propitiation, which means the satisfaction. He satisfied the holiness and the wrath of God, the justice of God when He died for us. He is the, the propitiation for our sins. He wiped out our debt that we owe God. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Um, the other day I saw a Catholic, or pardon me, a Calvinist Bible. I saw a Calvinist Bible with notes, okay? And they made that he's the propitiation for our sins. That meant the Jewish people, Jewish believers, the Jewish elect, but not for ours only, also for the sins of all those other kinds of people out there. Not each and every individual, by whole world he doesn't mean the individual people, but the various ethnic groups and that sort of thing. Okay? Which 
if you read 1 John, he speaks to my little children. He's very, very clear. He's talking to born-again people and, and not categorizing them, not dividing them up and saying, well, this is for you Jewish saints. Okay? No, it's for born-again Christians. All right? Uh, he says later on in 1 John that, that we're the born ones of God. Um, so he's their propitiation for our sins, the people that believe in Christ. For, for God's children, God's people. He died for our sins. But not just for us. He died for all those people out there that don't know Him. Who could come to know Him. And become one of us now. Okay? He died for the whole world. Um, and, and not just people groups or something like that. They've got their ways and means of trying to explain and get out of these verses. But just read them and accept what they say. Okay? You don't need somebody to twist them and distort them and pervert them. Okay? Just read the Bible and see what it says. Um, okay, anyway, there's other things I'm tempted to, to add that I don't have time to. Um, okay, so that's limited atonement. Jesus died for a certain few people. And beloved, look at this world. It is very, very, very few. What percentage is it? Okay, the 7 billion people in the world. 1.1 billion, roughly the last statistics I saw. Over 1 billion claim to be Christians. Okay, now at one time I claimed to be a Christian, but I wasn't. I, was, I went to a church that was a Christian church, but I didn't understand the gospel. I had not put my faith in Christ. There are probably a number of you who could say the same thing. Yeah, I went to church most of my life, and then bingo, I understood John 3.16 or some similar verse, and I put my faith in Christ and Him alone, and I was saved. Okay? Claiming to be a Christian, having the name, or walking in, into the doors occasionally of a Christian church never made anybody a Christian. Okay? So, out of that 1.1 billion who name the name of Christ, how many are truly born again? If every one of them was, one out of seven is what, 14% of the whole world that God chose? Okay. And of course, the percentage is really much, much, much smaller. I would say it's probably more like one or two or three percent of the whole world are actually God's children through faith in Christ. All right? Um, and Jesus only died for them. Um, let me ask you this. What would Christ have had to do to expand that payment for sin to include, let's say, one more person? He chose one more, one additional person that he decided, I want him to go to heaven. What would Jesus have had to do? shed a little more blood, hang on the cross a second or two longer, you know, a little bit more agony, a little bit more pain. What would he have had to do? Our sin was paid for by Jesus' death on the cross. There's no way to increase that. And if that death was sufficient for us, why isn't it sufficient for the rest? You see, these things, that, there's, there's no ground for believing any of this thing, any of this stuff. Okay, we got to move. Um, irresistible grace, the next point. Irresistible grace. And we've already discussed how that, you know, Terry would have to take my watch. 
Um, definition, the sovereign bestowing by God of regeneration and faith upon those whom He has chosen by His own will, since they are incapable of understanding the gospel and exercising faith, this bestowing must be irresistible. Okay, and I put in parenthesis, otherwise it could not happen. Okay, if they flat out cannot get the gospel, they cannot understand it, there's no way that they can understand it, well then God's got to do something or else they'll never get it. Okay, and that's what Calvinists say total depravity, you cannot understand, so therefore God has to give it to you in an irresistible fashion. Okay, if you could resist it as a lost person, you would resist it, unless it's irresistible. Okay? I don't know if that all makes sense, but hopefully. Um, John Piper, one of the most famous Calvinists today, and I'm sure a good, decent man, says, the new birth is the effect of irresistible grace, an act of sovereign creation. So the new birth, regeneration, is the effect of irresistible grace. So God regenerates you without your faith, without any conditions on your part. Um, Calvinists say that if grace is not sovereign and irresistible, then man can boast. Uh, Arthur Pink, one of the most famous of all Calvinists, he has written books and books and books. He's dead. He's been with the Lord for some time. Um, he's got lots of books. And a lot of his stuff is terrific. He's quite a scholar. Okay, as if you can just get him away from Tulip. Okay. Um, Pink says that if man could of his own volition believe on Christ, then, and this is a quote, then the Christian would have ground for boasting and self-glorying over his cooperation with the Spirit. Okay, look at me. I am so smart. When the Spirit of God convicted me, I put my faith in Christ. I cooperated with the work of the Holy Spirit, and now I'm born again. Aren't I brilliant? <laughs> Have you ever heard a Christian say anything anywhere close to that? I never have. The only Christians that I've heard talking about salvation, it's all that, you know, hey, I was a lost sinner. I had no hope. There was no way in this world I was ever going to get to heaven. And somebody sat down with me and showed me the gospel, and I trusted Christ as my Savior, and it's all what God has done, and I praise Him. I mean, have you ever heard... <laughs> This is silly. What Christian has ever said, I'm going to get there because I'm smarter than the next guy. You know, I've, I've, got, I've got it up here, you know, and I'm going to heaven because no Christian ever said that. Okay, at least if they ever did, it wasn't anybody I ever heard. And I've been saved for over 50 years. So, uh, anyway. Um, that position seems to be logical, at least to the Calvinist, it seems to be logical, but is refuted by Scripture. Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Faith excludes boasting. Works provide an opportunity to boast, if you're going to heaven because you're good, because you put money in the plate, because you attend church all the time, now you're boasting. But if you're going to heaven because you trusted Christ, all the glory goes to the Savior, not to you. I mean, you and I, what, what is the old song? I'm a sinner saved by grace. Okay? I'm only a sinner. Saved by grace. To God be the glory. Okay? Wow. Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay? Faith is not a work. It has no merit. Thus there are no grounds for boasting when you have put your faith in Christ. Um, 
Romans 5, 2. Oh, this verse, this is an important verse. Okay, here's, here's one for you to get. Romans 5, 2, by whom, which is by Christ, also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Okay, Calvinists say salvation is by grace. Now, a lot of them don't mean that. They say it's salvation by grace. But it's got to be irresistible grace, sovereignly bestowed grace. If it includes anything, even faith, then you've done away with it. Anyway, what does it say here? We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. How did you get the grace? By faith. That's how you get God's grace. By faith. A lot of Calvinists believe you get God's grace when you get baptized as an infant. Okay, there's a lot of them, they really and truly believe that. That's where you get the grace, is water baptism. And of course, first of all, you had to be born into an elect family. And if your mom and dad are elect, then you're probably elect. And if you get baptized, well now we really know you're elect. Okay? Um, but we get, we have access to the grace of God through faith in Christ. That's how you get God's grace. Not anything you do, and certainly not your, your physical pedigree. Okay, the fact that your parents are saved means nothing, except hopefully you've got the opportunity to hear the gospel and trust Christ yourself. Okay, you've often heard people say, God has no grandchildren. Okay, well, He doesn't. Okay, we come to Christ, each and every one of us, as an individual. All right, so God's grace um, is not irresistible. It's not a work. Uh, it doesn't give us any ground for boasting. Uh, man can and does resist Christ. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay? Um, if God's grace was irresistible, then everyone would be saved. A while ago I read a, a definition that, about uh, limited atonement that God saves everyone, the atonement is for everyone that God intends to save. Well, it's very interesting because the word here in 2 Peter 3, 9, not willing, the word willing there means intention. Okay, it is not God's intention that any should perish. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants everybody to come to repentance. All right? But the Calvinist says God, or Christ only died for those God intends to save. Well, He intends to save everybody. So then shouldn't everybody be saved? Well, they should be, but obviously they're not. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.4, who will have all men to be saved. And, the, and will here means determination. God's, it's God's will. This is what, He not only wants it to happen, Okay, but it's His will that all men will be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It's a stronger word. This is what God wants to happen. This is His will. This is what He's trying to accomplish. Again, if it's irresistible, then why isn't everyone saved? You know, if God's grace was irresistible, why would we witness? I even wonder, why are we here this morning? Okay, did everybody get as much sleep as they wanted last night? Okay, maybe you did, I didn't. Okay, it was a shock when that alarm went off this morning. Okay, it took me quite a while to find it. <laughs> um, I could have done it with another hour or so. You know, one of the benefits of retirement, and, and I'm, you know, retired supposedly, um, I set an alarm Sunday morning. And that's almost the only time I ever set an alarm. 
The rest of the time, I can get up whenever it feels good to get up. Okay, it may be at 5 o'clock, but it's still when I feel like getting up. Okay? Um, okay. Um, the gospel invitations in the Bible all indicate people have a genuine choice to make. Irresistible grace is never stated in Scripture. You will not find a simple, straightforward, clear, understandable verse in the Bible that says Jesus died for only certain people that God chose ahead of time. It doesn't say it. It's not there. And if it's not there, why do people believe it? Okay, and an awful lot of it is because they made a decision about what sovereignty means. And now they've got to shoehorn the rest of the doctrines around salvation. They've got to shoehorn them into that definition. And if, they, if the scripture doesn't seem to fit, then they have to force it to fit. They've got to make it fit. Okay, which is not the way we treat the Bible. Okay, we are supposed to... Okay, a couple of words that some of you would be familiar with. Exegesis. Okay, exegesis. Big, fancy sounding word. What does that mean? It means we get out of the Bible what's already in the Bible. Okay, it's there. We read it and we get it out. Okay, we're taking from the Bible what God put in. Eisegesis means it came from here and I force it into the Scripture. I'm making the Bible say what I want it to say, which is not proper. No, God speaks. If, if we do that, is it the Word of God any longer? No, it's my Word. Okay, the ideas come from me, not from God. Okay, it's, it's no longer the Word of God. It's my Word. Um, logic and a lot of Calvinism is, it's, it's, some of it is actually logical. But if you build logic on a false premise, you come to the wrong conclusion. Okay, every time. It, it may be, wow, oh yeah, look, this is built brick upon brick upon brick upon brick upon brick, but the foundation is sand, and it's going to collapse. Okay, it won't stand, and that's the way Calvinism is. So, uh, logical, but it's got a false premise, and it produces a false conclusion. Matthew 23, 37. Um, o Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under, his, under her wings, and ye would not. I can remember when I was a kid, some neighbors had a bunch of bantam chickens, okay, banties. And I can remember one time. Um, I don't know what happened, but there was something that the hen who had all these chicks uh, thought was, was dangerous. And this, this little bitty hen, you know, spreads her, her wings as well as she can, and all the chicks run under her wings, and they're sheltered under her wings. Well, Christ says, I would like to do this to the people of Jerusalem. Okay, I would like to save you from danger. I would like to protect you. I would like to do everything you need. I want to be as a mother to her children. Okay, I, but you won't let me. Ye would not. Instead of coming to the shelter, they're scattering in different directions. Okay, they're resisting the grace of God. Um, John, th John 5, 39 and 40. Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. 
and ye will not come to me. Whoa, ye will not. Man has a will. Okay, man has a will. And they often exercise it, most of the time they exercise it the wrong way. By rejecting what God says. And here Christ says, look at the Bible. It tells you how to go to heaven. It tells you that the way to heaven is through him himself. But he says, you won't come to me. Ye will not, that ye might have life. Okay? You could come, but you won't. And because you won't, you'll never have eternal life. All right? What do we do? Well, as born-again people, you and I, we've got to decide. And, beloved, this, this Calvinism is just one error. There are many, many, many other errors in the world. Okay, there's lots of false prophets. God predicted that there would be false prophets in our day. There's lots of them out there. So, be loyal to God's Word. Be loyal to the Bible. If you hear something, I can remember years and years ago, I won't mention the person, but there was a TV preacher who was just like this all the time. You know, smile. He's, and you think, wow, he's such a friendly, happy guy. You know, and he says Jesus a lot. Okay? So, does that make what he says true? Okay, what are you going to do? Scowl and be nasty if you're trying to attract an audience? I don't think so. Okay, you're going to be friendly. You're going to be happy. And there's lots of people out there that they look good. But you've got to ask yourself, is what they are saying true? That's the issue. Not how often do they smile. Not how often do they say glory to God or praise the Lord. Is what they're saying true? Um, don't be intimidated by higher education. Now, there's a lot of preachers out there that don't have much education. That doesn't make them right. It doesn't make them wrong. Going to seminary and, you know, John Smith, B.A., B.S., M.A., M.S., T.H.D., D.D.T., uh, no. Uh, That's an old poison if you don't, if you don't know. <laughs> don't be intimidated. Just because somebody's got a string of degrees behind his name, you know, that means he had enough time and money to keep going to school. Okay? He may not have learned a cotton picking thing, but he had enough time and enough money to keep going to school. A lot of other people, they got whatever education they needed and went out and did something for the Lord. Okay, but this guy's been to school for 20 years because he's got all these, these degrees. Now, don't be intimidated by that. It doesn't mean a thing. Okay, not a thing. Um, be discerning about who you listen to on the radio. Who do you watch on TV? Okay, obviously the church that you go to. Uh, the books that you read. And... Uh, We've, we know the gospel. We've got to preach it. Okay? If we believe that everybody out there has a salvation already provided, they've just got to learn about it and understand it's by grace and trust Christ as their Savior. If we really believe that, then we need to be out there telling them. Okay? This isn't something that we keep to ourselves. We've got to spread this message. Mm -hmm.